everyone. Welcome to yet another Women Tech Makers SSA Spotlight webinar. My name is Onajite Emera Ogo, and I lead Women Tech Makers at Google in SSA. For those of you that don't know, Women Tech Makers is a global initiative that provides visibility, community, and resources to enable women in technology to thrive. Women Tech Makers SSA Spotlight was created to amplify the stories and pathways of successful women in technology across SSA. And this series will connect women with economic opportunities in tech by demonstrating specific ways that women can jumpstart and develop in their tech careers. So today the spotlight is on Ire Adirino Kun. Ire is a self-taught front-end developer and a user interface designer from Lagos, Nigeria. She's also the co-founder, COO, and VP of Engineering for Bycoins, and she's also our very first female woman Google developer expert from Nigeria. So Ire is going to join us today, and she's going to share a little bit about her journey of building a successful career as a woman in tech. Hi, Ire. Hi. Hi, thanks for having me. Thanks so much for being here. So the spotlight is now on you. How would you like to, do you have a presentation or would you just like to jump straight into Q&A? Yeah, so I'm gonna um, share my screen and just kind of go through this presentation that I've um, put together and then afterwards I'll be free for questions anyone might have. Okay, let's see awesome. this works. <laughs> and works properly, okay, let's see, share, okay, and then I'll try and do the full thing. Yeah. Okay, so is it like working well now so I can start? Yeah, go ahead, we can see it. Okay, hi everyone. <laughs> Ms. Erie, and I'm going to just be talking today about my journey into tech and I guess like lessons I've learned along the way, basically. So like I said, my name is Erie and I'm from Lagos, Nigeria, of course, and front-end developer and user interface designer. And yeah, I'm working at Bycoins, which is a cryptocurrency exchange for Nigeria, Africa. And yeah, also expert in web technologies. And I also write a blog, um, which is about like front-end development. And I haven't written that much recently this year. I think I've only written like one article this entire year compared to when I first started when I was writing like every single week, but you know, 2020. <laughs> um, yeah, so this talk is kind of going to be divided into two parts. Um, I'm going to talk about just learned across my tech, along my tech journey rather. And then I will at the end just talk about like very practical tips for getting started in tech that's to do with like my own journey and how um, I got to where I am. So obviously we're gonna start with my own journey and um, the lessons I've learned. So let's start with like just how I even got started in technology in the first place. Um, as a child, I was always pretty interested in technology, actually. I remember, like, my dad getting his first phone, and he was always surprised how I seemed to kind of just know to, like, use it. And I used to do this kind of thing, which I don't know who else has done this, because I actually just Googled. This is one of my own things, like paper computers. But I just kind of Googled it to see if, like, I would find any other images. And it seems like other people did the same type of thing, because I obviously didn't have a laptop like really young so I would like make out of paper and I'll have like screens I don't know where this idea came from <laughs> but that's just kind of how so I was pretty like into technology as a whole and I built my first website when I was about like 14 um I used to play this game called Neopets and um it allowed you to basically like do some simple like html and css to do with like designing your profile and like that so i kind of just learned um very little html and css from there and then i would then like make websites around this so i actually created this thing called spook designs which was supposed to be like, my design website where i would put like designs that other people can use to like, do their own pictures and stuff like that so i definitely into it 
And yeah, I just continued with it like on and off for years. Like I built lots of websites for friends. This is like one of this is like one of the things that I did. And at the time I really thought this was like the best designed thing ever. <laughs> like this whole border and like even the font of like Charlie's list and all of that. I was very proud of this. And um so it was basically just something I was always really interested in and I just kind of came back to and I always basically would just jump at the chance to you know do something related to it in like school projects things like that so whenever it came up I was definitely interested and it brings me to the first few lessons that I've learned so the first one is that you don't really control what your passion is like I didn't necessarily choose that this is going to be the thing that I'm very interested in but it just kind of like manifested itself and that's not even really saying that your career will be the same thing as your passion they can be separate things but it's just to say that if this is something you're passionate about it's not even something that you really control and this I don't think it's something that you really don't and secondly, it's not always going to be easy to know that something is your passion just like in the moments. So like I said, this sort of just started as a curiosity and then it developed into an interest and then it developed more and more into there. So it's just kind of like to do with following your gut and just going with what is like peaking your interest. And the other lesson is that you never really know how or where your tech journey to starts. Um, I don't think I necessarily had the most conventional route into technology. Um, so don't necessarily be worried about that you're not going through it in the same way that you might think is the way to go through it. Just sort of take advantage of, you know, whatever situation you're in. And the next stage of my tech journey um, was deciding or coming to the decision that I actually wanted to pursue this thing that was my passion into like an actual career. So since I can remember, I was really confused about what career path to take. Um, in like 2005, I first discovered programming. I kind of just, I briefly considered it as a career, but it didn't seem like it was a viable career, at least at the time, and at least in Nigeria. So even when I spoke to my parents about it, they just kind of said, well, this is just like a hobby. I don't understand, like go and read law or something. <laughs> and um, and so I just thought maybe it wasn't really something that people do as a job. Maybe it was just like a hobby type of thing. So when I was going into the university, I actually just studied what my favorite topic was at the time, which was psychology. So my undergraduate degree was actually like psychology. But when I was going to graduate from that, I still wasn't really that sure what I wanted to do. I was still kind of like confused and didn't necessarily want to enter the real world yet. So I decided I'll go and try and do a master's. And then I did that like in law. So yeah, I was just doing something completely different. And it was while I was doing the, my master's in law that I actually met a student studying computer science. And I actually like really discovered what they were doing. And that kind of just led me back to realizing, oh, this is something I could have studied. And this is something that I basically have been doing. And basically meeting that student kind of just validated the idea for me. And I just started to do more research I like met with family members where I tried to like outline the validity of this as a career. And what was funny is that most people still actually said that this isn't really something you can survive off of, obviously. They just said, oh, this doesn't really like, you know, a proper career. Like you have a law degree, you should go do this. But what I ended up doing was that I just said, okay, I'll give myself after I graduate, I'll give myself like a year to see if I can make this viable. And if I can't, then I will go and do like law school and things like that. So I did some freelance, got a job, and it kind of actually just basically took off from there, really. And the biggest lesson I learned from this in my journey was just to trust my guts basically <laughs> because I had a very strong feeling that this is something that I wanted to do and um even though a lot of people that I was looking up to and like my mom and my like aunts and uncles and stuff um were telling me that you know this doesn't actually seem very viable I just 
knew it was and I just knew that I had to at least try even if it wasn't going to work out I had like backup plan but knew that I had to at least try but of course you should kind of take this ice with like a pinch of salt there's definitely a balance strike between like trusting your guts and um listening to ice because in a lot of cases a lot of people or your you know, aunts and uncles, older generation and stuff, they do actually know things. <laughs> so it's not just to be like, oh, don't listen at all. It's about like trying to understand the balance. And for me, the reason why I felt comfortable um, like going against their advice was because I understood that they didn't actually really understand this industry anyway. It was like a relatively new thing. So obviously they were going to say that this isn't really, viable thing because they don't really know that much about it really so you just kind of also need to ask yourself like how strongly do I feel about this and then you balance that against the advice and all of that and another thing I learned is really to like do more more research first and if I had done that maybe I would have avoided like two completely unrelated degrees I could have just gone and studied computer science for example and what I all did was sort of just trusted from like that initial conversation I had with my parents before I even did my undergraduate degree. I just trusted that they knew what this was a valid career or not. But if I had actually gone and done that research, then maybe I would have had, um, like I would have realized this sooner and I would have gone study computer science and all of that. So make sure you do your research to find out, you know, what is valid and what is not. And obviously, it's just never too late. And the thing is, I know for me, um, I didn't end up starting all that late in like the grand scheme of things or like life. Really, I still actually got started in my early twenties. Like, I think I graduated when I was like twenty three, twenty four, or something. So, starting at that age isn't like starting. Not like I started when I was eighty or something like that. But at the time, it still felt late to me because like. If I had just studied it for my undergraduate, I would have had like a full, like two, three years. I would have already been ahead by that amount of time. So it did feel like it was too late, but um, I'm glad that I still pursued it anyway, because even if I started now, if I start like when I'm 30, 40, 50, whatever, it's not too late. You can still like start doing it. So once I had made the decision to like pursue programming, I knew that I'd have to like work on building my skills. So um, I was still like doing my master's at this point when I had made the decision. I didn't want to do like a whole third degree. <laughs> so I just decided I would try to teach myself basically as much as possible. So doing like online courses and stuff. And this is the first time I was writing actual CSS. I remember because back when I was doing um, like styling, I guess, in my like teenage years and stuff, it was basically just table things like that. So it wasn't actually proper CSS. I learned about proper CSS for the first time while I was doing these courses and just like reading blogs and stuff. Um, I did one short course short course <laughs> that was in person which was actually like in london it was basically one week and it was just nice to go to a class but i liked going to classes and things so it was nice to have that sort of almost school-like experience even though it's basically just like a week and basically what i learned is that passion is like a great thing but um it's great because it actually just allows you to do all the hard work that you actually need to do to become really great at what you do. Because it's not like passion alone is going to be what you need. You need to then put in the actual work. But if you have that passion, then it doesn't feel like you're putting in so much hard work. It's just more like you're just doing something that you love. So the next thing that was important is, you know, actually trying to build my network because, you know, I've started um, studying and learning and stuff and I'm picking up skills and I'm doing like work, but I need to, you know, build up my network so that I can get jobs and stuff. And it kind of brought me to this problem because I was like self-taught. So how do I really let potential employers or even freelance clients know that I know what I'm doing? How 
like how would they know that I'm knowledgeable at what I do. And like I said, I actually started doing freelance. I really did not enjoy it at all. <laughs> I just found that I didn't really enjoy working with clients that much because I felt like I was quite passionate about, you know, front-end development and making websites and doing it in a way that I think is like good. But I think when you're working with like clients, they don't necessarily care about that aspect. They just kind of want it the way they want it. And there was like so many issues where like, oh, a client will say they want one giant pop up here, you know, like make the logo big, that kind of stuff. And I was just like, you know what? I don't want to deal with any of that because it was just like, I, I just couldn't. So like I wanted to get a proper job, like a you know, I'm working within a startup or a tech company where I can work with people that actually care about you know, building things in the right way and all of that stuff. And that's kind of how I came across this problem about, okay, so like, how do I build up my portfolio, build up like CV, things like that to let potential employers know that, oh yeah, I can actually do what I say that I can do. And I, and like a turning point for me was when I listened to this podcast, I don't even know if it's still going on, but this is like developer T. This is obviously like five years now. Um, and on this particular episode, um, they talked about how like having a blog and writing is just important to be more visible and um, to show that you are knowledgeable in like this space, right? Because in the tech space, yeah, you should have a degree, but a lot of people don't have the degree. So it's more about showing in other ways that you actually know what you can do. So I kind of took on this challenge and said, you know what, I'm actually going to start writing a blog. And it was really important for two reasons. So one was like having to write an article every single week. And I did this every single week for two years, actually. And having to do that really just like forced me to build my technical skills because at a certain point, like you're sitting by everything you already know, you have to start like learning new things to write about. And that was actually really great in pushing me to learn about, you know, HTML, CSS and JavaScript. And that's kind of why I care a lot about writing those language well because I feel like I've just spent a lot of time really looking into it. And the second reason was um, just putting myself out there. Like I said, I was trying to find a job and I thought, I was convinced anyway, this podcast that this would be a good, um, a good way to do it. And um, what's really great was that important people in the industry actually started to notice, started to read like my blog and actually start sharing it. And um, it ultimately was like probably one of the best things I've done for my career, just starting this blog, just starting to write. And then I also started doing some speaking. Um, I My first ever talk was like at a GDG event in Lagos, um, which was really scary. <laughs> and then after that, I think one of my second or third ones was at Frontiers in Amsterdam, which was incredibly scary, but it was ultimately quite fun. <laughs> and then I spoke at more and more conferences. And then in one pictured here, it was like the largest audience I've ever spoken to with like over 2,000 people in like one arena, which was very, very scary as well. <laughs> And then I joined the Google Developers Experts program. Um, so all of that of the writing, the speaking stuff led to me being like recognized and becoming like the second GD in Nigeria. So the number one lesson I obviously is the importance of putting yourself out there because if I never did any of that, never like took the chance in, you know, putting myself there with like writing and speaking and none of any of this will happen because I can be maybe really good at what I do, but if I'm doing in isolation, then you know what nobody ever knows and it really even matter. And this is particularly important as well because I think we particularly struggle with putting ourselves out there. I read 
I had read this quote from Lean In that women only apply for jobs they feel like 100% like they take all the boxes for the job description and everything where I will just do so even if they feel like they only meet like 60% of the requirements and that's not even to say like the approach that men take is like wrong in any way it's actually better to just go for it because like I don't know that quote that you miss 100% of the shots you don't take or something like that you just need to put yourself out there the worst case is that you'll get rejected but you will get a lot more opportunities than you would if you just never really put yourself out there. And it's definitely not like an easy thing to do, um, to like step outside your comfort zone and really put yourself out there. And yeah, I know because I'm not particularly like a, um, I don't know, expert or person that likes to like talk in front of a lot of people or anything, especially like in social settings, right? It definitely gets here. It's not that you overcome and you never feel nervous about any of these things. It's just that you learn to kind of push and push through it and not necessarily let it um, stop you from doing whatever you're going to do. Because like I said, I'm still nervous every time I have to like give a talk or publish blog post, make a pull request, anything. But it's just kind of practice that you learn to um or or just not really think about the um the nerves and that just makes it better the next step in my career was all about finding the quote unquote right job since i stopped freelancing um i or since i stopped freelancing i've had four jobs including my current one so the first one was uh, digital craft and it was like the first job I got after doing freelance which I was like incredibly happy to have stopped <laughs> and it was definitely a good stepping stone and um it allowed me to like you know get that environment that I wanted just to work with other people that really cared about um like the craft this thing then after that was working um at Big Cabal and this really really enabled me to grow because I was the most part like the only developer and then also I guess the lead developer <laughs> but um there was a bit of limits like the growth I could have being basically the only slash lead developer because I didn't necessarily love anyone to like learn from in that sense so I applied to a bunch of different companies and even the application process before I eventually got this job at IO like slash ad block was maybe a year or something or even maybe like six months of just applying 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 and it was definitely a rough process but um to work at i was really great because i was able to or at least my aim anyway was to work with other developers to really get that growth and it didn't necessarily end up that way but i did definitely like enjoy the process of working there what i said was i ended up like starting by coins and it basically just started as a side project and it just kind of grew from there and before we knew it, we were having like a real company. We had gotten into the combinator and we were actually having to, you know, drop everything else and focus on this. And I think the lesson I really learned from this is that like the path that you want is not necessarily what you will get. Um, because what I really want was after working at IO, I felt like, you know what, I actually just want to go and work for something like Google or Facebook where I could, um, you know, learn everything I needed to learn. And then I can feel more equipped to, you know, start my own company and stuff. And to some extent, that's sort of like echoing what I said before about women feeling like they need to meet 100% of the requirements before they can do this thing. I felt like I needed to go and work at the even consider like starting my own, but it didn't really turn out that way. There was an opportunity to go down this sooner than I thought. And you can't, I just had to like go for it, right? And the lesson is like, 
not really to hesitate leaving a job that you feel no longer serves you. And I think that um, perhaps more in the older generation, there was a mentality that you get into a job when you're doing something and you just within that company and work yourself up over the decades. But that's not really like the way, at least the tech industry works anymore. It's actually more um, beneficial for you to actually be always on the lookout and see, okay, what other job can I get that will, you know, serve me better? And all this tweet from someone a couple of years ago just saying that, you know, switching jobs every 16 to 24 months on average, like she's been able to gain more than $30,000 increase in salary. And like I said, it's just a change in the generation where people are starting to is that, you know, it's not just about staying in that same job and hoping they promote you. If you see something that you think will benefit you more, don't be afraid to switch so that's more, um, that's basically it on the lessons I've learned. And I just want to give you a bit of some practical tips, depending on what phase you think that you are. So if you're still trying to decide if tech is your passion, um, I think one of you do is just try as many different areas of technology as possible. One site that I used, which really, really, um, was really beneficial to me is called um, codecademy.com. Codecademy and they're really great because they just I dive right in and just try different things and actually build real world projects. And then it's also free as well. So it's really, it's a way to just try different things. And then going to meetups, obviously outside of or after <laughs> COVID and all of that, going to meetups is also a really great way to just, um, try different things or like you can even do this online now obviously just watching different um presentations from different areas to just get a feel for how um different things work so if you're trying to decide if to pursue a career in tech i'd say first getting this from knowledgeable people is helpful so not just your like parents or aunties and uncles or stuff people who are actually also in the area that can give you like, specific advice and then secondly just knowing that it doesn't have to be like your passion like I said that's just my story but it does mean that your job or your career needs to be the thing you're most about you can still do something that is enjoyable and it's still like a great job to have so if you're trying to build your attending conferences like I said post COVID in person or just now like online, like we're doing, um, that's a really good way to allows you to focus. So that's one thing I like about physically going to a conference because you just kind of block off that time and you say, this is the time I'm going to spend doing this. Whereas if you're at home, it's harder to really block off that time because you're kind of tempted to um, do different things. Yeah. I'd going to conferences whenever that's possible reading blogs um definitely um also help. and then online courses as well so udati is great for more in-depth like full on if you want to like master something that's like a good thing to use or lynda.com is another one that i personally use as well and they're a bit shorter or you can get a range actually um but that's another one that i would really recommend and I have actually put it together like a guide to learning front end development. So we'll just kind of take you from basically knowing nothing to just being be like, I guess, entry level into that kind of role. So you can find that on my website. So next, if you're trying to build a network, definitely, definitely, definitely start your blog. As you've seen from my own story, that's what has started my entire career. So I can't really underestimate enough like how um, important this is. And another thing to know about is that it doesn't really matter what level you're at. You can start a blog having just learned yesterday, right? Because you can just write about stuff as you are learning. And also whatever you already know, be useful to someone who doesn't know that thing. And then speaking as well, I think this is even more um, 
it will probably it will put you out there even more. So that's one thing you should consider doing if you feel like um, you want to, you know, take your um, network to the next level. And then finding the job. So one thing you have to remember is that like you don't really have to have the whole path of what you want to do like outlined out, right? Just what's good for you now will be good for you next. You don't necessarily have to know what you're going to be doing in five years, or at least that's the way I operate. I've never really said, oh, we're going to be in X position. I think focusing on the media is completely fine and just know, okay, is what I'm in good for me? Yes. Or if no, then what is the next thing that will be good for me? Okay, so thank you. That's um, basically my story. These are my links, and um, I think we're going to do a Q&A now. So I'm going to start sharing my screen. Hey, thanks so much, Ire. Um, that was awesome. That was really, really awesome. Um, and thank you for really wrapping it up with some of those practical, um, really practical tips. You answered some of the questions that we already had prepared, which is great. Okay. Um, <laughs> So I'm just going to dive in. We have a couple of questions from the audience as well. So I'm just going to mix and match some of these. Um, try and be a little bit quick because we only have about half an hour left. So okay. first question is, it probably hasn't been really easy for you to become you know, as successful as you are in such a male-dominated industry. Um, so can you tell us about some challenges you've faced, if any, as women in tech and how you've overcome them? Yeah, I'd say for me, I've been very lucky slash fortunate in that the people I've worked with have always been um, like really great. So I haven't necessarily had um, a lot of issues in like trying to find a job, for example. I don't think I even switched around all that much. Um, and now I'm in a position where I'm like one of the founders, right? So it's like, I've, um, I don't necessarily need to be in the position where I'm looking for a job and things like that. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I've just been pretty fortunate, I would say. Okay. Okay. That's great. Um, so like you said, you come from a non, you know, non-traditional background and you've come into the tech industry, you didn't study computer science. Um, you've given us some, some idea as to how you've kind of built your knowledge as a self-taught developer, but, do you think you have any disadvantages apart from like the time spent pursuing other degrees from not having, you know, a computer science degree? Um, the thing is, I think practically speaking, like in the terms of work, I don't think there's any disadvantages because things change so quickly that um, everyone, even if you go to school, you're going to have like do some self taught like catching up and all of that stuff. So I think the main disadvantage is actually just the feeling in yourself of maybe feeling like, oh, you don't necessarily have enough knowledge and things like that. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of people that are self-taught and also women in particular have struggled with like imposter syndrome and all of that. So I think that's probably more what it is, just psychologically mm -hmm. feeling like, oh, I don't have a degree. That means I don't really know enough or something. And mm -hmm. I don't know, I guess in my... Um, for me, it kind of pushed me to try to like just learn more. So, um, but if I like in general, like I said, there isn't actually a disadvantage to it. It's more about mm -hmm. like your mindset, uh, you really approach it. But like even when we hire people at buy coins, I don't think I even look at where they went to 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 school or what they studied. Like it's basically just oh, show me your like products show me like what you've actually done i don't necessarily care where you went to school because you could have gone to school and still don't know anything so <laughs> that's not like that's not the priority <laughs> okay no that's perfect and that's a perfect segue into another question we have is how do you deal with imposter syndrome mm. yeah there's definitely a question i get out. <laughs> And for me, I think what has like helped because it's definitely something that I struggled and I was more in the past tense now um, mm -hmm. with a lot in the beginning. Um, I think for me, I just tried to, I guess ignore it is what I would say. <laughs> like, even though I have all these fears and all these feelings, I'm like, oh, um, 
maybe I'm not good enough or whatever, I still, it doesn't like stop me from, I guess, accepting like, oh, an invites to go and get a conference or something, mm -hmm. or it doesn't stop me from still writing. So I can have those feelings, but I just try to kind of push it aside and say, okay, even if I feel this way, I'm still going to put myself out there and, mm -hmm. you know, whatever happens, happens. And I think through doing that over the years, now I can just feel like, okay, you know what, after doing all of this, I can't, I can't keep saying I'm still an imposter. It doesn't make sense yeah. at this point. <laughs> so like you have just, I guess, fake it till you make it. <laughs> fake it. Uh, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Okay, cool. um, let's see. So, I think you kind of touched on this a little bit, but we wanted to know a, a little bit more specifically, how would you advise somebody that's in the middle of their career outside of the tech industry who wants to pivot into tech? What are some of the first things you think they should do? And it might be you know, the same as what you've said before, but just to reiterate some of those points. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely something you can do. Like, it's not something only for people who started when they were young or something like that. You can still start. And that's why I kind of mentioned things like Code Academy or my front end learning guide or something. So, basically, things that are free and online, you can do at your own pace to get a taste for it to see if you're actually even interested in doing it in the first place. And I think it just kind of goes from there. You just start small and then you stop from there. So definitely recommend Code Academy, and okay. because they, their courses are also pretty short, it allows you to just say, okay, over this weekend, I'm gonna try front-end development, and then at the end of the week, I actually have something to show for, to say, oh, okay, I've actually built this thing, and I'm interested to know more, and then you can keep going from there. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, that's some great advice, thanks. Um, let's see, so, Right now, you're combining a role as a VP of engineering and a co-founder. Are you facing any challenges balancing, you know, all of that responsibility? Yeah, it's definitely hard <laughs> because it's very difficult to have to like switch between like operational stuff to like actually coding and things like that. But I think just having good time management is helpful and just knowing how to properly block your time because for me for example when it comes to like coding i really need to have a block of time where like nobody talks to me <laughs> so i just focus <laughs> and do it so i can't really do that on the same day that i have a bunch of meetings right so i uh -huh. have to make sure that i schedule things where i have okay is a week i don't have any meetings so i can properly like shut off and things like that and where where else during the week I can find time, I can do it. But just, you know, knowing when I can do some things and just being very good with organization, basically. <laughs> awesome, awesome. And I guess that brings us into um, another question. So obviously you you have a team that are working with you, you're managing, some, you're managing techies. So we have a question here mm -hmm. around how do you manage techies? How best to help them optimize their potential at work? Hmm. Okay. Well, within Bycoins, we are very, we're kind of very anti micromanaging people. <laughs> so okay. we're very much, I guess, because myself and Timmy are very much people where we don't like being micromanaged. So we also don't want to really work with people that need micromanagement. Yeah. So the way we generally work is that we have like tasks, and at the beginning of our sprints, we kind of go over it and everyone like brainstorms how they're going to approach it and things like that. And then um, we, so we talk through like things more high level and then we talk about like the details of implementation and then we're kind of people are left to go and do it however they wish i guess but obviously we have like deadlines and things but we're mm -hmm. not necessarily there telling them okay you have to write it in this particular way <laughs> and then we obviously do code reviews and things like that but i think we're very more about um like i said assisting with you know the broad architecture but letting people you know implement things that the way they see fit and um we also really care about trying to like facilitating growth so um we you know try and support people however we can like oh if they want to do this particular course as long as they can make the case for how it will benefit everyone as a whole then yeah we're like cool with that as well and uh 
yeah, I think I think the, that's basically how. <laughs> okay, great, thanks. Um, so we have a question here around what inspired you? What was the inspiration behind setting up your Bitcoin platform? Um, uh, well, it's really, really big right now. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, at the time, it was more, I think we were doing it around slash just before the whole Bitcoin boom, like a few years ago. But it really came out of just like, we wanted to get Bitcoin and there was literally no easy way to do it. You had to go on like um, what's called local Bitcoins or something where you're trading with people. And for me, I was just not interested in doing that at all. I wanted something like Coinbase where you would go and click buy and you bought like I'm not interacting with other people. And then I don't have to wait for the person to see their bank details and just <laughs> things like that, that didn't really like make sense. So we just saw a very clear like gap and we thought this is something that we can actually um, solve, especially with new things like Paystack that was like um, just growing and actually enabling us to like do payments easily. So the infrastructure was there and saw like the the need. We saw a gap and we're like, yeah, let's let's see <laughs> see what we can do. And yeah, this is how we um, came came to buy coins. Yeah. I guess that's that's how you know a lot of you know really great startups get started. You figure out that there's a need in the market from your own personal experience, and then exactly. you see if anybody else has solved it. If not, you go ahead and do it yourself. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. um, so we have another question here from from Mary saying, "Do you do you still do UI design designs? If you do, how do you balance you know UI designs and front end mm -hmm. development?" Yeah, I do. Um, I don't do all the UI design for like Bitcoin stuff. Um, so we like occasionally work with other people to do like design and stuff, especially for smaller projects. Like when Send Cash was just about to be launched, we had someone else do the design and even like the development as well. But um, but yeah, I still do design, and we're in the middle of trying to do like a redesign of buy coins as a whole so doing a lot of that as well in terms of managing it i think the way it typically works is that you kind of have to separate it anyway um in that it's not like i can necessarily be building and landing at the same time um the design has to come first and for me i find it better to sort of just like try to ignore the developer hat and just think about the design otherwise it can start to get a bit restrictive if I feel like I'm still thinking about how I'm going to implement it as I'm doing the design, because then it will naturally make me favor things that are maybe easier or like just simpler, just out of the fact that, oh, I know I can just do it this way. So it has to be like that. So I'm just trying to separate it as much as possible and saying, okay, when I'm designing, I'm designing, when I'm developing, I'm developing. Um, that definitely helps me be like stronger at both. Okay, thanks, Erie. Um, and another question here. So around your experience as a Google developer expert, I guess we have somebody who's interested in the program. So could you share a little bit about your experience and the process of becoming a web expert? Okay, yeah. So um, I learned about the program through the Women Tech Makers events actually in Lagos, I guess it's like four years ago now. <laughs> yeah. So that was, um, that was like, uh, nice experience. I think it was Yedi that came and was talking about it. And I basically just went and asked him, oh, well, my first question was like, what do you mean by experts? Because I don't know if I'm an expert, but, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I feel like I'm pretty good at this. But what exactly do you mean? <laughs> but um, yeah, basically, you just start by, you know, talking to someone like Anyadi or someone who's leading the program for whatever country. And um, you put together a CV which shows both like your technical expertise, but also your community work. Because that's um, a major part about being a GD. It's not just about being an expert. It's also about doing things like writing and speaking and all of that. So you have that kind of called, it's called a community CV where you're kind of putting that together. And um, so they review that and then you have like, some interviews with GDs and like Googlers and things like that just to, I guess, talk about both as of it. So like a tech, sort of a technical interview, but it's not like the real Google interviews where they make you like do stuff on a whiteboard. 
um, which is also a horrible experience, but <laughs> um, this one is at least just like, they'll ask you questions and then you can just explain like oh, CSS or JavaScript or something. And then you also speak with like a GDE to talk about like your own community um, work and things like that. And then, yeah, it's basically, it's, it's kind of like a job interview to be fair. So if you're thinking about what to do to prepare, I would say just prepare for the same you for like a job interview. Okay, cool. And how's your, um, like your experience being a GDE? What are like some mm -hmm. of the things you've, you know, gotten out of it and some of the things you've had to do? Mm. Okay, so um, it's mostly been, it's like been kind of like a nice validation. So it kind of shows, it also helps with stuff like imposter syndrome, right? If you're feeling like you don't really belong here, but then if you get part of the program, then that kind of validates you. Although yeah. for me, it still made me feel like an imposter because I was like, but why did they actually accept me in this program? <laughs> <laughs> but you know, after a while, you like ignore that. But um, yeah. I mean, I work so... at Google. And I still have imposter syndrome, so <laughs> I don't just this time. Exactly. Um, so yeah, it's been good in terms of um, also putting myself out there more. So um, mm -hmm. you're kind of put for more talks and things. So if there's like Google events happening. I remember one of the first ones was when they re they just released the progressive web apps concept and there was like a whole road show and stuff. So I was able to go and speak in like Kenya as well. And um, obviously getting to go to Google IO is like a nice thing and getting invites to um, Chrome Dev Summit, whatever is relevant to your particular expertise. So if you're like a cloud person, I think their own conference is cloud next or something yeah um yeah and also having access to googlers in your particular field so i now have mm -hmm. access to like the chrome team so if there's like something new happening we get that information and we're able to um learn it and understand it and actually start even like producing content for it before um it's properly out mm -hmm. there so you can it sort of gives you that edge to maybe be a bit like ahead of things that are coming out so yeah awesome awesome and i think the chrome the chrome dev summit is starting soon actually yeah it's next week awesome. yeah it is next week yeah <laughs> i'm excited <Okay>, cool. <laughs> i think chrome dev summit is my favorite one um, yeah to go to yeah because i always just learn so much and like there's no event that's so focused on web Mm. Even Google I.O. is very biased to Android. I think Google prefers Android <laughs> to, <laughs> to web. So like every other event is very like um, biased to something else. But, I, but Chrome mm -hmm. yourself is obviously just about web stuff. So it's nice to just be around people that are like really into web. Yeah. I guess you're all, you know, you're all familiar with it and it's, it's what your primary thing yeah. is. So. Yeah. Okay. I'm not going to talk about the, the biases and other things. <laughs> <laughs> okay, a couple more questions. I know they're they're telling us to wrap up, wrap up. Okay, but I've still got a couple more questions for you. So, um, you've had to scale, you know, scale your way up to being, you know, one of the top women in tech from our region, which is amazing. How would you describe your journey in one word, and why did you choose or? Why that? Why oh that word? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I guess like perseverance, maybe. Wow. Okay. I don't know. I feel like, um, or I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'll go with perseverance, just because mm -hmm. it's kind of just felt like. Um, working towards something, maybe not even necessarily knowing what that something is, but just kind of mm -hmm. persevering and trusting that I am working towards something, even though like I said, it's not like the vision is so clear that, oh, I know yeah. I'm going to do this particular thing, but just sort of trusting and yeah, if that's the right word, but I'm going with that word. <laughs> no, no, that's awesome. I love that, perseverance. Okay, cool. Um, and I wanted to ask a bit about, you know, your work advocating for women. How do you balance that with your day-to-day -day 
you know, life in the tech industry, do you find that there are some conflicts or does it really complement each other? Um, I think it definitely complements each other. And um, it's definitely like a new venture and doing something sort of different, but it's nice to be able to still bring my expertise and my organizational skills and all of that, because I think a lot of the skills from like development can still be, it's also just about like, you know, organizing things well. And I think a lot of things that people don't necessarily think of as tech skills, like being able to write well and stuff, mm -hmm. um, that's definitely transferable to other other things outside of like direct tech. So I think, yeah, it is, it is more of a compliment. Mm -hmm. Okay, that sounds great. And so a final question, um, and just because I'm not 100% sure you've already answered this somewhere else, but I'm gonna ask it anyway, just for our audience okay. here. So here at Women Tech Makers, we're really focused on creating a world where all women can thrive in tech. And today our spotlight is on you. So based on your experience, what do you think is needed to make this happen? Mm. Well, I think um, it's more about like opening the door and having the option to everyone. Because I think one of the major problems is that as women, we don't necessarily know that this is an option for us in the first place. And that's why there's such like a, an imbalance. And for me, I happened to like, I guess stumble into this career out of like some random online game that I used to play. So it's not like anybody ever told me. And like I said, I actually didn't even understand what computer science was until I was doing like my master's, which is just completely crazy. <laughs> and um, I feel like this sort of education of someone telling me and telling other women that this is actually something that is for you, that's just going to be so, so powerful because like I said, I think the major problem is that women are told that this isn't for them. And so yeah. most of most of us don't even consider it an option until, I don't know, like their adult life or something. Whereas for guys or for men or boys, um, they're encouraged from a young age and that's why there's more of them. Thanks, Iri. That's really, I think that's really, really accurate. And I mean, we, we definitely need to continue building community, building, having these conversations is so essential. And I think representation as well, seeing someone like you speaking about your journey and having come from a non-tech background is even more, you know, eye-opening and more exciting for a lot of women out there. So thank you so much for joining us today. Um, this is all we have time for, but it's been an amazing session. I think all of our viewers, all of our listeners can, you know, definitely take something away that they can practically use to advance themselves in their tech careers, or just maybe just start thinking about going in that direction. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, and for everybody watching, if you'd like to learn more about E-Ray, please, how can they connect with you? I mean, you can look on my website or follow me on Twitter. I'm pretty active on there. And uh, yeah, my blog, like I said, I haven't really written much this year, but <laughs> you can read the count. backlog. <laughs> exactly, this year doesn't count. <laughs> okay, perfect. And for Women Tech Makers, if you'd like to learn more about our programs, um, please visit our website, womentechmakers.com or follow us on social, social media or on Twitter and Facebook. You can also join a community near you or become an ambassador. So find out more information on our website. And please also hit the subscribe button and watch some more of our previous Spotlight videos and other tech video, tech, tech events that we've had on this channel um, that you may have missed. Thank you everyone for joining us. Um, thank you, Ire. Have a great rest of your week. Thank you, you too. Bye. Bye.